here's a quick recap of what we did these weeks. And we've looked at quantum mechanics, the mysterious, unexplained. That's why they're mysterious. They're mystical, right? Properties. And we took it about the coherence, okay? Uh, that, uh, like, for example, in the slit experiment, the uh, the particles would not would be in phase all along or the wave would be in phase but it re interacts with the environment and because of that it goes out of phase and that's that decoherence phenomenon that they've noticed in the lab can they explain it no they can't they just say it is so entanglement one particle over here affects another one over there one far away from the other how do they do that they don't know they can't explain it they just say it does so it's a it's a fact okay superposition one particle vibrates, the other one doesn't vibrate. It's the same particle. How can one particle vibrate and not vibrate at the same time? Can you explain it? They say, no, we can't. It is so. <laughs> God ordained it. It is so. That's what happens. These are the explanations they give you. These are all the physical interpretations, the names for each of those physical interpretations. Schrodinger's cat, the cat is both dead and alive until you peek inside the box. It's got to do, all of these essentially have to do with dualities. Uh, the mathematicians love dualities because it, in a way it helps them uh, cover every base. They can say, well, why this? Well, this is because of A. And why that? That's because of B. But A is a contradiction of B, but they use both simultaneously and they call that duality. And they love these things. Okay, complementarity, life, light is both a particle and a wave. They say it behaves. It's the same thing because when you say it behaves as such, you are in, in essence simulating here as a particle and here as a wave. Okay? So they're saying, depending on the experiment that you run, that's the way they uh, uh, sweep it under the rug, the problem. No, the problem is you cannot say that light is both a particle and a wave, and that when you measure, you do something, it, it collapses to one or the other. You can't do that. Not in science, maybe in religion. Uncertainty, uh, the ball stands still, and when it stands still, you know very little about its motion. And when it's moving, you know very little about its standing still, its location. Great. Again, dualities, contradictory dualities, okay? And they, they, they love these things. You know, they say, oh, it gives us something to think about. Spin. Spin, what is the problem with spin? Spin is not spin. That's the problem with spin, okay? Spin is not spin. Spin is some kind of orientation of some kind, and they measure at that. It's like chopping light or the electron at that point and saying, oh, it's pointing in that direction. But they use the word spin because they want to give you the notion that this thing is twirling around like a top, and that's what they're going to use when you say, well, but is it twirling around like a top? Is that what you're telling me? Uh, no, it ain't. It's standing still. We measure and we say that's half spin, that's minus half, that's one, that's zero spin. They give you all these numbers for uh, orientations or tilt of the spin, whatever that is. So hopefully you understood it all. So all these are uh, unexplained properties. That's all they are. They just say it is so. We don't understand it, but it happens and we can use it for technology. And that's why they use the word quantum as an adjective for everything. Quantum dot, quantum computer. Why? Because they're going to be using the phenomenon which they don't understand or can't explain. And they're going to use that to say, well, we use the effect in technology, in the computer. Oh, yeah, great. You can use it. It's like saying, I'm going to use a magnet to pick up uh, iron filing. You don't know how it does it, but I can use that for something. You know, because uh, here I can use a magnet to pull something out like a car in a record uh, yard. Okay, so you can pull and you say, okay, I can use it, technology, can you explain it? Oh, no, uh, I, don't, I don't know how, how Mother Nature does that. That's the issue. The issue is that's where you have to break your brain, because hopefully Mother Nature doesn't do these things with nothing. Hopefully she does it with something, something which is invisible and intangible. And that's what magnetism, light, and gravity, that's what all those are. They're invisible and intangible mediators. We can't see them, we can't touch them, and these people hope to see and touch them by running an experiment in the lab. That's the problem. Okay, okay and today we're going to do recoilless, recoilless emission. What the hell is recoilless emission? Okay, here's, um, you've seen this maybe somewhere, uh, when you look at a crystal lattice, uh, any crystal for that matter. Well, you say well, it doesn't move, but it does. It does to some degree, and what they're saying is that atoms in a crystal lattice do move. Okay, so uh, you got to think about that whenever you're looking at these notions that um, uh, things are solid and they're just standing still. They're saying, no, the electrons are vibrating and maybe the atoms are vibrating as well, you know, so these things vibrate. And that's what they want to show you in, in general terms that this is the, even if it's, a, if it's a solid, it's not standing still. 
Remember, uh, what, what is the duality that stands still while it moves? Okay. Okay. Um, so here we have uh, an example of that, which I showed a couple weeks ago, the phonons. Okay. Uh, what is a phonon? Well, it's a bunch of atoms that move in some kind of way. So they have all these um, uh, notions, these uh, phenomena that they call phon phonon. The particle of sound, it gives you a, a, a sound of some kind. And so they track it by sound. Uh, you know, we had the, uh, what is it? The photon is the particle of light. We had the chronon, it's the particle of time. We have the Higgs, the particle of mass. And now we have the phonon, the particle of sound. So they've created all these notions out there. Can they explain any of them? No, they can't. They just say they, all these uh, move in the crystal lattice uh, in some way that they can measure, that they can detect. Okay, uh, so, so we know that these things aren't stuck, okay? Uh, at least this is the theory that they say, you know, these atoms, these electrons are moving around, they're vibrating. It's not like standing still, even though you got a rock, a crystal that looks solid, uh, the atoms in there are not standing still, okay, or the electrons. Okay, so that's the starting point. And so what, what did Mossbauer come up with? Well, here it is. Give me a second here. Let me put this up here. Okay, this was Mossbauer in uh, 1958. He came up with it, the Mossbauer, Moss Mossbauer effect, or recoilless nuclear resonance fluorescence, is a physical phenomenon discovered by Rudolf Mossbauer in 1958. It involves the uh, resonant and recoil-free okay, emission and absorption of what? Gamma radiation. They're going to talk about gamma rays. Gamma rays are high frequency, ultra high frequency rays. Okay, it's important to keep that in mind. By atomic nuclei uh, bound in a solid. Okay, so there is no recoilless emission. So even though there you see them vibrating and so on, and the light, I put it as a wave here, goes outwards, there's no, uh, uh, the, the atom itself does not recoil, at least for the gamma rays. Okay, that's what he was able to measure. He got a Nobel for that. Okay, okay. Uh, it turns out that, um, you know, we have this idea that it's more like this, okay, that the atoms are not vibrating. We think of it that way, okay? And again, we're talking about gamma rays here, okay? So it's important to keep that in mind. We're talking about <clears throat> very high frequency uh, light, okay? What was this good for? Well, uh, a couple of years later, uh, we had these pair of uh, people, Pound and Rebka, and they ran the Harvard Tower experiment in which they toyed around with this phenomenon. And they were able to prove uh, what it says there, the, cl the last classical test of general relativity. They were able to verify it, okay? What they saw essentially was that light coming out of the basement, uh, that's where Rebka was, going to the tower at Harvard, uh, where Pound was, uh, it had a different frequency uh, in that, uh, in that, in just, uh, I think it's just three stories high, maybe a little more, maybe it's, I don't know how big, uh, how tall the, the tower was. One was in the basement, the other guy was in the tower, and what they said, the guy from the bottom shot the light, and the guy in the top, um, notice that the frequency changed. Each one measured his own frequency. It says the frequency changed and the wavelength got longer, essentially, okay, lower frequency at the top. And so they said gravity is pulling on uh, light. So they confirmed that gravity bends light with that, essentially, okay, it warps light. And so, yeah, it's got to do with the, it's the gravitational redshift experiment. Redshift meaning, again, uh, it's a Doppler type effect, okay, whether it's, if it's coming towards you, okay, it's uh, blue shifted, it's receding, it's red shifted. And so they're saying it's a red shift experiment. The farther uh, light is from you, from the source, uh, the more red shifted, the more uh, the uh, links, in the case of the rope, are farther apart. In other words, the wavelength is longer, okay? Or the frequency is uh, lower. Okay, uh, measure the change of frequency uh, of light moving in a gravitational field. Okay, so in other words, the gravity is pulling on light. That's what they said. Frequency blue shifted towards a higher frequency. And test demonstrated uh, the general relativity prediction that clocks should run different rates in different places of a gravitational field. All this as a consequence of uh, Mr. Mossbar. Turns out that Mossbar uh, got his noble, but these fellows did not. <laughs> Which be, and they proved the... Uh, uh, the last uh, classical thing from general relativity, that, which is quite interesting. You know, they, they didn't even get a mention. <laughs> well, they did get mentioned, but they didn't get a noble. Okay, so uh, w what I like about Rudolf is that he was a professor, several universities in the States and in Germany. He's originally from Germany. And this is what he would tell his students. Otherwise, he wouldn't pass them on the test. He was quite strict with them. He said, explain it. Explain it. 
the most important thing is that you are able to explain it. Yeah. Love it. Thank you, uh, Rudo. Rudy. <laughs> I'll call him Rudy. You will have exams. There you have to explain it. Okay. He's going to, he asks his students to explain it. Great. Eventually you pass them, you get your diploma and you think that's it. No, the whole life is an exam. You'll have to write applications. You'll have to discuss with peers. So learn to explain it. Uh -huh. You can train this by explaining to your to another student, a colleague. If they are not available, explain it to your mother or to your cat. <laughs> okay, so uh, Rudy says, you got to explain it. Otherwise, I guess he's saying you're not a physicist, a scientist or whatever. Totally in agreement. Did Rudy explain it? I mean, he, he discovered the Mossbauer effect. Did he explain it? And the answer is no. He had no clue why that was the case. Why uh, the atoms did not recoil. Because you would think that, you know, when you shoot a, can a cannon, shoots a ball, which is the quantum version of how uh, light is uh, uh, created and expelled from the atom because light has origin in the atom. Well, here, if you take a cannon and you shoot it, well, the cannon will go backwards. And so if the photon is energy and energy is mass, you would think that, uh, you know, there's this recoil. And Mr. Bosbar says, no, there ain't, but he cannot explain why there is no recoil. He just says, it is so. It's another one of those, it is so, discoveries of quantum. Okay, uh, the first problem that uh, Mr. Bosbar had to, in other words, the first thing he should have explained, really, is why uh, we have springs, you know, these uh, notions that all atoms are interconnected and there's like um, a spring that's acting between the atoms. Because that's what a lattice is. The crystal lattice has atoms, but the atoms are, you know, uh, separated from other atoms and there's something in between them because they are able to maintain this rigidity, this more or less rigidity that you see in, in crystals or rocks or whatever, okay, metals. And uh, uh, here's a testimony from several sources. Okay, and I want you to look at this. It says one guy, Disney, uh, says, but the electromagnetic theory is not based on action at a distance, as was Newton's space is thought as, be, of, as being threaded throughout with electrical and magnetic what tensions, whatever tensions are. Okay, really what he's saying is it's space is like it's threaded throughout. Next guy, this is Ebbing, he wrote his general chemistry. Chemical bond acts like a stiff spring connecting nuclei. As a result, the nuclei and the molecule vibrate rather than maintaining fixed positions relative to each other. Again, he got that from, uh, essentially, uh, from, from uh, Mossbauer, right? Uh, the notion that, you know, they maintain fixed positions and there is no recoil when they shoot out uh, this energy they call light. A field in physics may be envisioned as if space were filled with interconnected vibrating balls and springs. That's the Casimir effect. And then um, there was a paper uh, out of this electromagnetic wave physics 2000 at the Colorado University. And, and uh, folks write over there, wiggling one charge causes the field lines attached to it to wiggle. And after a time, the other charge starts to wiggle. It's just like a rope connecting two rocks. Yeah, that's what it looks like. That's, that's what these people are describing, two atoms connected by a rope. The wave here consists of wiggling line of electric force, which you can think of as being attached to the vibrating charge. I mean, how much more evidence do you want than all this testimony? These people are telling you that atoms are interconnected. You have to think of them as if, as if. Well, now, why not go the whole, you know, mile and say, well, what if they are interconnected, physically interconnected? Because they never identified what they say interconnects them that acts like a stiff spring that vibrates, et cetera, et cetera. What are they talking about? What is that thing that they say that you have to assume as that it's there as if they were connected? They're all saying the same thing. They're threaded throughout. It's like two rocks connected by a spring or, or whatever. What are they talking about? They're, what is that entity that connects the two rocks, the two atoms, the two whatevers? And, you know, again, they, they do the math. They say, uh, like in the case of entanglement, this particle here affects that one over there. The math is great. No problem. They measured, they, they've got it down pat, but can they tell you what that physical entity that's sending the message to the other particle is? They never identified it. Is there such a monster in quantum mechanics? No, the answer is no. You can look up the standard model. You won't find that mediator even mentioned. It's not, that's when they talk, when they give you the physical interpretation, they throw that in there and say, assume that it's as if. 
but you don't see it anywhere. And so that's what you have to ask them. Say, well, what is this thing that interconnects the atoms, that vibrates, that does all this stuff? I mean, if it vibrates, hopefully it's a physical object, right? What's vibrating? A uh, concept? <laughs> okay, it turns out that they had uh, an answer for many years already. It comes from Mr. Einstein. Okay, Einstein wrote in 1905 his paper. You know, his uh, paper is on the electrodynamics of moving bodies, okay? And what did Einstein say? Well, he said, light is always propagated in empty space with what? A definite velocity. It'll see there, okay? Which is independent of the state of motion of the emitting body. He's saying that light is independent of the motion of the source. And again, you've heard of that, uh, maybe, uh, where a train... What happens if you turn your flashlight or, or your car, your car is driving down the road, you turn the flashlight? Should you add the speed of the car to the, to the light? And the answer is no. But Einstein could not explain it. Again, he could only tell you, it is so. That's mathematical physics for you. They describe, they tell you, it is so. And we can predict that it's going to happen again and again and again. Yeah, great. So far we have a description. Tell me why. What's causing that? See, under the rope there's no problem because you're moving through the rope through the ropes, many gazillions. You're moving through, let's talk about one. One atom is moving, one hydrogen atom is moving through the rope and the rope is uh, forking out at the electron shell and going over and forming part of that shell momentarily and then continues going. So what you have is a bubble made of uh, L, um, uh, threads and one thread, the one from that specific rope is going around the atom. So the atom can never touch the rope, it's just going through it. And that's why when it pumps back and forth, uh, giving signals along the rope, it's not adding its velocity to the rope. It's just whatever uh, um, expansion and contraction it does, that's what's going to determine what the frequency or link length of the rope is. It's got nothing to do whatsoever with it pushing the rope, which is what people think when they're saying, if I turn the flashlight on while well, I'm on that train or in my car. So yeah, you, you don't add the speed to the, uh, to the signal called uh, light because the threads, the two threads that form the rope go around the atom as the atom moves through along the rope, okay? Just like sliding beads on an abacus. Does the bead push the wire along which it's sliding? And the answer is no. And so, no, you don't add the speed uh, of uh, light to the uh, motion of the source. And he never figured it out. He, uh, he said, it is so... Uh, but he could not explain why, the physical cause of that, okay? Okay, so uh, what's the issue? The issue is that um, here's, uh, here's again uh, Mossbauer's recoilless emission. We're saying that the atoms are not moving in this case as gamma rays come out of there. How did we do it in uh, under the rope model? Here you have it side by side, okay? We have it with a rope, okay? So the uh, atom does not have to move at all. If you move that, uh, let's assume that's a cube, a crystal of some kind. If you move it, it's just going to eat into the rope. It's going to slide along the rope. It's not going to uh, push the rope, in other words. Okay? And why uh, is, um, again, the, uh, the frequency uh, of light the same? Uh, it doesn't change. Well, here, you, uh, I think I've explained this in the past. Here you see it that um, what you have is that um, all you're changing as the atom is expanding and contracting, what it does is just torques the rope at different rates. By doing so, you know, the rope does not have um, any chance of going faster. All it can do is change the frequency for the wavelength, in this case, the link length. Okay, so there you see eight links, for example, in, in the top one. And if the atom is pumping slower, then you're gonna have four links. And if it's pumping faster, you're going to have 16 links. What changes? Well, the rope, is, the length of the rope, the physical entity that mediates light, is the same in all cases. You have the same one meter or whatever uh, amount of rope. What changes is just the number of links produced by that amount of uh, rope threads. So this is this is the uh, answer to Einstein's first to Einstein's um, question, but it also answers uh, Mossbauer's question of why there is no recoil. There's no recoil because there is no push, okay? especially for gamma rays. It turns out that these people, um, they, they are not able to measure exactly the gamma ray. So the 
party line today is that, well, we can't measure so much at that uh, frequency. And so what they say that essentially there's no recoil because they cannot really measure at that level. Okay. And so they do a mathematical calculation and that's it. But again, they have no physical interpretation for their calculation or for their measurement. They don't know why that's the case. Okay, so this is where we have differences with these folks. Okay, what are the conclusions? Let me go through them here. Uh, recoilless emission is just another unjustified discovery of quantum mechanics. They have discoveries, they have no explanations. None, none whatsoever. Mossbauer never identified the springs that vibrate between atoms and holds them together in the crystal lattice. But what is that thing? What is that spring that holds two atoms together or that keeps them apart or whatever? They never identify that. They just say, you have to make uh, believe that it's there. It's like, it's as if it were there. <laughs> Why not just say it is there? Okay, Because you can't see and touch it. Is that the reason? Mossbauer never explained what causes the effect named after him. Okay, he, he never could explain the Mossbauer effect. He just described it. He says, it is so. Einstein never explained why light speed is independent of the movement of the source. Okay, so we have uh, all, all these unexplanations. <laughs> no one can explain uh, what he discovered. They all get nobles, they all get their names and lights, but not one of them can explain what's going on. Okay, and the Rogue model emerges Mossbar uh, effect with Einstein's principle of relativity, which is the uh, you know, constancy of the speed of light. And light always torques at the same speed along the electromagnetic rope. Why? Because frequency is inversely proportional to the length of the link. You make the links smaller. I always show that in my rope. Let me get this one out of here. Here you have a rope, okay? And the more you torque it, the more links you have. The less you torque it, the longer the links and the fewer links you have. That's why the speed of light is a constant always, okay, in every situation. And that's why we have recoilless emission, and that's why uh, Einstein uh, could not add the speed of light to the uh, movement of the source because he was thinking push, and he could not explain why it wouldn't be so, why you don't have to add it. And the answer is that the atom goes right along and slides through the rope, so it has no reason to push it, and it doesn't. 